Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured. But the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. Book 6 of Aristotle's Categories is devoted to the category of quantity, or the how much, or how long, or you know something in terms of number. One of the, or rather two of the things that, that seem to be closely connected that Aristotle discusses in the course of his analysis are time, or chronos, and space, or topos, sometimes also translated as place. Now, why does he examine these? Well, because he says that these are types of quantity. There is something else that I do need to say right at the start, which is that Aristotle gives a lot more analysis and discussion to the, the notions of time and space in some of his other works. And what he's providing you here is sort of just a little thumbnail sketch in terms of quantity, not discussing these things primarily uh, on their own account. So if you're interested in that sort of thing, you want to you go to some of his other works like the physics and the metaphysics, but we're not going to do that here. We're only going to worry about what he actually says in chapter six about time and space. So what does Aristotle tell us? He says that both of these are what he calls continuous quantity. So not discrete quantity like number. And that might be a little bit difficult to wrap your head around at first because we think of numbers as actually following in a sequence. So, uh, you know, how, and we also think of the number line as well in mathematics uh, so that numbers are all jammed up one on top of the other almost and touching each other and, you know, bleeding over into each other. That's not at all how Aristotle thinks about it. But that is how he thinks about time and space. So what does he have to say? He says time is a whole and continuous. Why? Because present, past, and future are linked. They're connected with each other. And we often ourselves picture this in you know, two complementary ways. Like, you know, the past is back there. We, we think of a line, right, usually, right? And we're somewhere along the line. The past is back there, and the present is right here, and the future is yet to come, and we're, like, moving into the future. Or we could think of the line as, like, us staying still, and here comes that future, right? and then the past is receding behind us. But all of these moments exist in some sort of continuity with each other. That's what Aristotle says at one point. At another point, he will say, well, I'm not really quite sure about that because if you think about it, strictly speaking, um, moments of time don't exist except at that moment of time. Uh, now that's looking at it from the point of view of the present. What he's talking about here is a, a, you're looking at it in a, in a somewhat different, more abstract view. Um, but in any case, he views it as continuous. So he says, uh, these are all linked with each other. Space is also this kind of quantity. Why? Seeing the parts of a solid themselves occupy so much space, and these parts have a limit in common, he says, it follows that the parts of space also, which those parts themselves occupy, have exactly the same common limit or term as the parts of the solid. So he says, as with time, so is space then continuous. The parts meet at some common boundary. So that, that's, 
you know, there's, there's really two key elements to this notion here as he's developing it. The parts meet at some sort of limit. So if we're thinking about like this, I understand we have an object right here, but imagine that we're just talking about the space this object occupies, right? This part is contiguous to this part, is contiguous to this part, and so on and so on and so on. So we might say, you know, in terms of inches, if we want to use that, here this inch, this inch, this inch, this inch, this inch. Oh, it looks like it's probably six inches, right? If I'm measuring remotely correctly. Um, all these parts are contiguous with each other. In, in terms of time, we just have that one sort of line in which the parts are connected with each other. And it's not really a line per se, because that's in space. Uh, we just have some sort of you know, connection. In terms of space, each part is connected with more parts than just one because it, you know, we, lit, we exist in a plenum, a three-dimensional plenum. So there's meeting at limits, right? These two parts meet here. Um, my wrist is where my hand and my arm meet. And we can get more and more refined with this sort of thing. You know, my, each one of my hairs meets my scalp at the follicle, or I know the follicle is inside, but you get the idea. So that's one key thing. The parts meet at, at limits. The other part is that, the other thing, the other feature, is that the parts have position, thesis in, in, in Greek, or, you know, the words to set in place in relation to each other. And as we mentioned, when we're thinking about time, you know, what we started out talking about at the very beginning, the, the earlier time when I was talking about that, that exists in a certain relation to what I'm doing right now and what will be happening three minutes from now. It's interesting because you yourself can represent this to yourself in YouTube by looking at that timeline right below the video that allows you to say jump forward three minutes or jump backwards three minutes, right? Uh, in some cases, you even know when the advertisement is coming up because there's a little, red, a little yellow notch there that shows you that. So that's one way. And then there's, you know, in, in three-dimensional space, all of the parts have position in relation to each other as well. So I get closer to the camera, right? I go further away from the camera. You notice that because of perspective, and that's all about positioning, right? So this is continuous quantity. This is, these are certain aspects of what it means to be continuous quantity. Most importantly, there is some sort of how much, uh, an area, a space, a length of time that we can measure out. So that's one key idea. Another key idea that Aristotle explores here, you notice that Aristotle is very interested in what has contraries and what doesn't and how we can think about contraries. Contraries are taanantia in Greek. Those are the things that are opposed to each other like black and white or uh, good and bad and, and any, any of these sorts of things. Now, um, Aristotle says that Time doesn't have contraries, right? One time is not opposed to another time, and there's nothing else that you can oppose to a time, right? So it doesn't make sense to talk about time as having contraries. But what about space? Space does seem to be the sort of thing that might admit of contraries in the way that Aristotle is looking at things. Why would that be the case? Well, think about words that we use in opposition to each other, like above and below. Those seem to be contraries, don't they? They're not actually contraries, though, according to Aristotle, at least not contraries in the same sense as black and white or good and bad or hot and cold would be to each other, or sweet and bitter even. Um, why not? Well, when we're defining them, and he actually uses the word define there, um, horistai, right? Uh, when we define these things as contraries, um, we're actually doing so in reference to something else. So as opposed to contraries that can exist in a subject. So, you know, we've got, a, we've got for example, a book, right? 
All right, let's, let's not use the book. Let's use a piece of chalk. Piece of chalk is cold, heated up, and now the piece of chalk itself has admitted of change. The coldness is gone. Heat is now there. We can predicate heat of it. Um, it, has, it has a different contrary. That's, this is a process of change. Um, I go from being a good person to being a bad person. That doesn't happen all at once, but over, over some time, right? I change. Um, it's, it's me, the substance, or the piece of chalk, that is what is a, a allowing the change. In this case, above and below is just in reference to another point of space. So to say this space is above and this space is below is making reference to something that's in, in between, another point in space, the center, he, he calls it. So these are not, strictly speaking, contraries. Now, he does say something very interesting as sort of a side remark. When we're defining contraries in a sort of metaphorical sense, we think of them in spatial terms, in terms of distancing from each other. What is furthest from black? White. What is furthest from good? Bad. What is furthest from hot? Sweet? No. White? No. Cold, right? There's a greater distance there. Dry, wet, we could use other things like that as well. Sweet, bitter, in Aristotle's uh, schema of tastes are the most opposed to each other. So we think of them in, in essentially metaphorical terms as distant from each other. So we're thinking in terms of spatiality, but there really are no contraries in space. There's just position. There's just relative position to each other. The other thing that, that he talks about that's, that's quite interesting is this notion that time and space as, as quantity in a primary sense provide us with the frame of reference for thinking about quantity in, in derivative sense. And I talk about this in, in another place. Um, an action, for example, or a process of change is, can, is understood and given a kind of number in terms of the time that that action requires. So, you know, how long is it? How long is this lecture? Look at the video. I don't know how long it is yet because I haven't finished and edited it. That process is, itself would have a certain amount of time, which I'm probably not going to measure, but I'll only know after I get up and I'm, wow, an hour has passed, right? Um, so time is, is quantity in a primary sense, and we measure other things with time. Likewise, space. You know, if we say this book is uh, six inches by four inches, which I'm not quite sure is true, but I'm willing to bet for, for the time being um, by, by an inch and a half, right? We're using a certain amount of space as the measure for this. Likewise, you know, my tie is, I don't know, a foot and a half long, maybe, maybe a little bit longer, using space, right? How long does it take me to tie my tie, the action, right? How long does it take me to, to undo it? Uh, not that long compared to how long it takes me to actually tie my tie. We measure these things in relation to time and space. So as types of quantity, time and space are incredibly important.